This program is brought to you from the Margaret Farrell Studio. Rewind. Your Week in Review is sponsored by the Wisconsin Realtors Association. Bringing Wisconsin communities to life with great homes, businesses, and neighborhoods. The Wisconsin Realtors Association. The voice of real estate. This week on Rewind, your week in review. A top Republican has filled a key vacancy on the State Elections Commission. Coming up, the attorney who was picked to serve again. Plus, Governor Evers calls a special session asking lawmakers to repeal Wisconsin's abortion ban if Roe is overturned. And a targeted attack against a retired judge has some officials calling for more protections. All this and more on Rewind, your week in review for June 10th. Hi, I'm Emily Fannin. And I'm J.R. Ross. J.R., let's first start with the big question everyone was talking about this week. After a six-hour debate, I guess, or meeting long with the Wisconsin Elections Commission, we finally found out that gubernatorial Republican candidate Tim Michaels will stay on the ballot Mm -hmm. after Democrats brought forth a challenge to some of his nomination paper signatures. Now, they haven't really, I guess overturned a lot of these challenges or not even overturned them basically kick people off the ballot because we are inching so close to a primary so did that did that really have a, a factor i guess in today's meeting basically the commission took a stance today of erring toward giving people on the ballot um, especially the michaels case what this is about is on his nomination papers there were some that had municipality of shaniqua which is where he actually lives his mailing address though uses heartland the rules say you have to use your mailing address. So what is your mailing address? Michaels argued that, look, no doesn't matter which one I use, it's the same place, it goes to my house. An important point of this was, from listening to the entire thing, was the state Supreme Court in 2020 got a case about the Green Party, right? Different issue there where the Green Party vice presidential candidate had moved during the nomination paper window and had a different address and different papers. The Commission deadlocked on that 3-3. It went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court eventually said, look, you waited too long, Green Party challenges, so you're not getting the ballot. But Mark Thompson, Democratic appointee to the commission, said, they, look, there's a message in that decision from the court back in 2020 of you should err on the side of getting somebody on the ballot. Let the voters decide. So, yes, there are things in these papers that don't match exactly what's in the law. However, I can keep you off because of that. So Michaels is in. Right, and there was also a lot of other signatures in question. There was 11 challenges mm-hmm. total that WEC listened to today. Uh, one, of course, was Michael's. There was 10 others. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you can see on this slide here, there was many others. Not too many surprises, JR, yeah. with all of these. And one that kind of stuck out, I would say, is Patty Schotner, yeah. because she ran in 2018, was kicked off and or lost re-election in 2020. And also her signatures were in question. And she also was part of the Democrats' press conference yes. <laughs> uh, when they announced that they're going to be challenging Michael's signatures. Same issue, but Michael submitted documents to the Elections Commission saying, look, no matter where you send it, which municipality, it goes to my house. In the materials presented by the staff today, they said it wasn't quite clear because she had not filed a response ahead of like this morning. So different issue there, but still the commission said, look, we went this way with Michael's, we're going to air the same way with her. Of those who were challenged, um, a libertarian candidate for the congressional district had, was already below the threshold of 1,000 signatures anyway. So they sustained the challenge to his signatures, but that's, he's already below, so it doesn't really matter. A candidate in the 31st Senate district, a uh, Republican, she, they sustained the challenges to her papers following the recognition of the staff. So she's below the threshold. She's off the ballot. Uh, everybody else stays on. So... And do you think we could probably see WEC try and clear up their language a little bit when it comes to their guidelines to signatures? I remember hearing Ann Jacobs that say at one point, we shouldn't have this many challenges each year, but yet a lot of these questions still come up every time. There, there, there's, well, in Mark Thompson's words, some nitpicking going on. For example, if you use like ditto marks rather than like putting down the municipality and the state, and does, it, does that count? Is there an issue there? Uh, what if you leave something off? How do you define legend? I mean, all these kind of small issues that pop up and every other the subject, uh, the substance of a challenge the nomination paper. There's also some confusion if you listen to the hearing like I did all six hours of it. Um, just what happens if you deadlock on a challenge, right? There's this multi-step process and even explaining it to each other, they were not quite clear like, okay, if we had deadlocked 3-3 three, three in the challenge today, then what happens? We vote to put them on the ballot. What happens if we deadlock on that? I mean, 
there's still some issues there that could be cleaned up with the Elections Commission, period, when it comes to how you address challenges nomination papers. And during, day, during today's meeting, there was a new face mm -hmm. on the commission. Assembly Speaker Robin Voss had his opportunity to appoint someone, and he went with someone who has actually already previously served on WEC. And that person I'm talking about is Don Millis. He is a Madison-based attorney. He served on WEC in 2016, and we just got word he was just elected as the new chair. Now, of course, we know that changes every two years. A Democrat serves and then a Republican, so WEC is still meeting right now, and we just got word that he will become the new chair. He actually received uh, decent rec recognition from across the aisle, and Jacob said, you know, kind of pleased to welcome him in her statement. Speaker Voss believe he's going to be a respected attorney who makes excellent decisions when it comes to election laws. So, you got to note, Bob Spindell, wannabe chair. And actually, after Millis was appointed, he brought up that in 2016, Millis was the commissioner who recommended the motion to allow clerks to fill in missing information on absentee ballot envelopes. Now, um, it was voted on unanimously back then in 2016, but it became the source of ire for Republicans in 2020, right? Because the rush of absentee voting with the pandemic, it was part of the challenges that Trump filed that successfully overturned Wisconsin's results. So Smith was saying, hey, this is a problem that, you know, he supported this. Oh, by the way, one of my old colleagues, Pat Pabletti, is out in Colorado now, did a story about how pre-Bob Spindell the commission voted 6-0 most of the time. When Spindell got on board, it started splitting 3-3 more often. Mm -hmm. Spindell's point was, we stopped caving, Republicans, once I got on the board, you should go with me. So there'll be some disappointed conservatives about uh, Bob Spindell. I think it's called Bob Sled is the hashtag on Twitter. You can support <laughs> Bob Spindell. But there's some tension there because Spindell is closer to those who have issued the 2020 election and want overturned. But Spindell, who is more experienced than Millis, also was one of the false electors, participated in that, um, has clashed repeatedly with Democrats on the commission. You have to have four votes to become a chair. He was not gonna get four votes. And we don't really know how he's going to vote on future election mm -hmm. issues. We don't know where he stands. Um, we know that Speaker Voss has said he doesn't want someone on the commission that believes the election was stolen. Uh, but he hasn't really, we haven't really, I guess, gauged uh, how he feels about the 2020 election because, of course, we know we have Michael Gableman and all the others on that side who still believe there's widespread fraud, et cetera. So it will just remains to be seen how his views carry out uh, as we head into a big election year. Also, News that just came down today, uh, Governor Tony Evers' parole commissioner, John Tate, submitted his resignation. I was told by Governor Evers' spokeswoman that Evers asked for him to resign. Now, he was kind of the center of some controversy over a case. He initially uh, released a man from prison who killed his wife um, in front of his children. That decision was then reversed. And then uh, he basically felt pressure from the family who visited Governor Evers. So this was kind of a, a an ongoing thing that happened. Um, and now he ultimately uh, did resign. So um, what he said in that resignation letter, we just have a quick snippet from it. He said, when I was first appointed to this position, I was told by many this was the most difficult job in the state. The difficulty could not be understated as no parole decision is easy and no decision can ever be truly satisfied in all interested parties. It's also important to note there was a uh, Republican, Roger Roth, in the Senate who tried to circulate uh, basically a petition mm -hmm. to remove uh, or I guess not confirm John Tate at the state Senate. That didn't gain any traction. So this is kind of a long time coming that Republicans have been advocating for to remove him. Roth actually now has a third petition he was circulating trying to trigger the extraordinary recession. Just started that yesterday. Uh, and that, so he was never confirmed. They never took up the nomination. I think it was actually appointed twice um, to the position because it died with the first session uh, without him taking it up. Republicans argue should take this up and shoot it down now. Um, leadership wasn't interested in that. You come back to the floor and in summer of an election year, you open the door to all kinds of things coming up on the floor of the Senate. So that's a side now. It's also become a political issue, a liability for Evers because Republicans keep harping this. Like, look, they're gonna go back now and point to any time he released somebody early from a murder sentence and say, this is a problem. Now, in Wisconsin in 1999, I think it was, we passed truth in sentencing, which means if you're sentenced 25 years, you do 25 years. Pre-99, Different story. This one case became like the big issue. He'd done 25 years of an 80 year sentence. Well, back when he was sentenced in 97, that's how things happened. You know, you gave him this longer sentence, they sort of piece of it as a reward for good behavior you could get out. That's changed. Um, but there's a liability for Evers for the pressure and take to resign. Ari Rebecca Clayfish is saying, 
state should have been fired a long time ago, quote unquote, and it shouldn't take an election year for Evers to do the right thing. Right, and Governor Evers is breaking records right now with uh, paroling people um, and freeing them back into the community. But like you said, JR, he definitely was facing a lot of pressure to act on this, and he finally did. So we'll see how it may impact him politically, but of course he did it very early enough before we get to November, so we'll see if it's still an issue. But I would agree with you that the tough-on-crime agenda and people being released on prison and just revolving door through the crime system is definitely something that Democrats are going to have to be addressing. Um, also, today... <laughs> There's been a lot of news uh, just this week, but I would also say today. Uh, a Dane County judge today found Michael Gableman, of course, who is leading the 2020 election investigation, in contempt of court, basically because he failed to follow a lower court order to prove why he deleted records, why he wasn't maintaining open record requests within his office. Things got a little testy in court, I will say. It was good for TV, I guess. Um, and basically, Michael Gableman, when he was called to testify, tried to basically say, I feel like I'm being put in this position. I shouldn't be in this position. I've tried to tell you why I deleted those records. But here's just a little bit of the exchange that he had with the, with the judge. I thought the only issue at play in this whole thing was 97 documents that we were late getting over to Ms. Westerberg. And the whole question is, should we be held in contempt and should someone go to jail because we were late? Now at 1014, I find out when you say, let me tell you what the issues are in this case. And now I find Mr. out your Gableman. intent is to Mr. let her do a Mr. fishing Gableman. expedition. Mr. Gableman. No more. I, I, I'm silent. Do you intend to answer any of my other questions, Mr. I Gableman? invoke the rights the Honorable Judge Revington just recited. What rights are those, Mr. Gableman? Is it the Fifth Amendment right to re, uh, not answer questions? It's the right to silence guaranteed to me under the United States Constitution, Judge Remington, the state of Wisconsin Constitution, and all cases interpreting the same. I uh, do uh, believe that um, the American Oversight has met its burden in addition to the uh, concession made on the record by the Office of Special Counsel that there Office of Special Counsel had not fully and completely complied with the um, uh, court's January order. And therefore, uh, American Oversight has uh, satisfied its responsibility to make a prima facie showing. Uh, based on the lack of evidence here today, I conclude that the Office of Special Counsel has not demonstrated uh, that the uh, disobedience to the court order was not intentional and therefore I will grant the motion and hold the Office of Special Counsel in contempt of court. So this is one of three lawsuits filed by American Oversight seeking hundreds, thousands of pages of documents related to Gableman's investigation. He basically felt like he was being railroaded by the judge today, actually called the judge a partisan judge. That's kind of what we just kind of saw some of those uh, intense exchanges while in court. I spoke to Gableman outside the courtroom and he admitted that he did delete some of these records, but he calls them irrelevant. And he basically said, if I had to keep every post-it note, every Every document, I would need a warehouse to store all of that. But, you know, we continue to try to ask him, this is a taxpayer-funded review. You know, why not keep uh, those records? Because taxpayers are paying for it. He still just said they weren't relevant and is still, uh, I guess, sticking with that stance. It was fascinating to watch a former judge and Supreme Court justice on the stand being trying to put his place by another judge. You could kind of sense that Gableman chafed at the idea of a circuit court judge telling him, a former Supreme Court justice, what to do. Uh, there's some tension there. Not a good strategy if you're in the witness box and face contempt charges to kind of mouth off the judge, but hey, I'm not his lawyer. I'm not going <laughs> to advise him what to do. Yeah. But this is more of the circus with the Gableman thing. I mean, look, whatever he uncovers, think about how we've gotten here now, right? I mean, just the continued issues from him saying at one point, I don't know how elections work, to trying to jail mayors over like not complying with subpoenas to open record stuff. This is costing taxpayers, by the way, hundreds of thousands of dollars, these lawsuits over the, um, the records because American Oversight is saying, hey, you didn't turn over stuff you're supposed to turn over. And now he's saying he deleted stuff. That's going to cost him some money. Well, actually not him money. It costs you and I some money. Right. Because he's acting as an agent of the state 
But I'm going to bet you when he is fined, if he is fined, taxpayers will pick up the cost of that fine. Right, and he refused to take questions on the stand, only really stated his name and his occupation, then was basically just arguing with the judge and the questioning that was trying to take place. And like you mentioned, maybe he will be fined. I think that will be coming down yep. in a few hours. The judge, uh, Remington, said he was going to be filing a report later. but. As we've talked before, too, Jer, we're at somewhere about $900,000 of a $676,000 budget that he was given for this review, and it is going to surpass that. I can expect right now that it's already probably past $1 million at this point because even other of those lawsuits are now got moved to September. So it's just going to keep going, I think, through this court process, which it does, but that just means this investigation is still just going to carry out and keep going. Now, of like the original budget he got of $676,000, he spent 458 roughly of like that on salaries, right. office supplies, and Robin Voss, the speaker, doesn't count the legal bills. Well, we're still paying for them, right. so I don't know how you don't, but that said, those are separate. Oh, and to your point about the delay, um, that case is about whether you can jail these may or actually have the Waukesha County Sheriff jail the mayors and local officials the locals were filed a response brief on Monday saying, uh, look, Gavlin's investigation is done under statutes that are part of the legislature, like what governs legislature. He can't go over here to these statutes and use these methods, i.e. the sheriff jailing these folks, to enforce a legislative subpoena. He must use the legislative statutes. Those statutes allow you to go through a contempt process through the legislature, which he's not doing. Now, Gavlin gets to respond on June, I think on Monday, yeah. or two, mm -hmm. two more, another week and a half. Then we go August 30th for a hearing. We're bumping up right up against the elections with this still going on. No end in sight, I guess yeah. we could be fair to say, on yeah. the Gableman investigation. All right. Other news this week. Governor Tony Evers used his executive powers signing a special session that will be happening in a few weeks on abortion access. Now, why did he do this? Is because if... Roe v. Wade is overturned like it is poised possibly after a leaked draft opinion by the U.S. Supreme Court is going to. Uh, that's why he wants to basically overturn and repeal an 1849 state law that would ban all abortions unless a doctor deems the mother's life is at risk. Now, we know Governor Evers' record on special session. I'm pretty sure he striked out on all of them. Uh, Senate Majority Leader was the only top Republican that we heard from that he basically says he is going to shut this down immediately. It is going to be held on June 22nd. In a quote, he said, Wisconsin, Wisconsin's law has not changed and our pro-life position has not changed. We will gavel in and out of another blatantly political political special session call from this partisan governor that was quote from Senator Mo Senate Majority Leader Devin Lemahieu. You know, at, at stake though here, I think Governor could win some political points, I think mm -hmm. is maybe the headlines that he can get, but I think we ultimately know nothing is going to happen. Well, Evers said this wasn't political during the news conference in Milwaukee, but it is. I mean, he wants to put pressure on Republicans to justify supporting a ban, essentially, that has no exceptions for rape or incest. And Josh Call, the Attorney General, showed up at the news conference in Milwaukee and said, this is no time for cowardice, using his words, Republicans. You should not stand behind your leadership. You should be on the floor taking a vote about this, telling people where you stand on this law. Um, so yeah, it is political, you know, but for good reason. They want to pressure them to overturn it because that's their philosophical point of view. Right, I actually forgot to toss it to video. This was the press conference of Governor Evers basically explaining why he decided to do this. Let's take a listen. I know not everyone shares the same views about abortion, but here's what I do know. Every single Wisconsinite should have the right to consult their family, their faith, their doctor to make a reproductive health care decision that's right for them. And every single Wisconsinite should be able to make that deeply personal de decision without interference from politicians who don't know anything about their life circumstances, values, and responsibilities. And at the end of the day, I think we should all be able to agree on this. We can't let our kids and grandkids grow up in a world where they have fewer rights than we did. That's going backwards. That's not the future we promised them, and that's not the future they deserve. Despite the fact that a majority of Wisconsinites support legal access to abortion, the legislature packed up and concluded their regular session work months ago,
taking no action to repeal the criminal statute we have on the books. So today I'm calling on a, for a special session of the legislature on Wednesday, June 22nd at noon to take up legislation to repeal Wisconsin's 1849 abortion ban, as they should have months ago, to protect the health and safety of Wisconsin women and to ensure abortions remain safe, legal, and accessible in this state. Now, lawmakers, of course, have to come back to gavel in and gavel out. And regardless of what they do, which I think we know what's going to end up happening is gaveling out, um, it could have political implications during a pivotal Mm -hmm. election year, right, that pro-choice and pro-life groups are really hoping to capitalize. But I think we've talked about it before. Is this abortion access debate going to still be relevant come November? And it really depends the timing of the U.S. Supreme Court's decision. Maybe they don't overturn it. We don't know what's going to happen. But I think definitely pro-choice and pro-life groups are hoping that it will energize the base. But really remains to be seen because typically August primaries are a little bit lower turnout until November. Well, yeah, Ron Johnson said he thought that if Roe v. Boyd's overturned, that the state ban wouldn't stand very long, that they'd do something to it. But we don't see any evidence of that. Let me, who has no interest in changing it. I think Robin Voss talked about what exceptions that he favors. There are some lawmakers, Republicans, who favor exceptions for like rape and incest, besides just life of the mother, which is in state law right now. But there's not going to be a ground of support among Republicans to go and loosen abortion restrictions in Wisconsin. That's not where the base is at right now. The Republicans running for governor have all pretty much said they support basically as is or with small tweaks. Um, they're not going there. Even if Evers is reelected, he can't force them to come in and pass a loosening of the ban. Just like with a special, or special session call, he can call it. He can't compel him to act. He's limited in his powers what he can do. We are probably going to have this law for a long time unless, unless there's a challenge to the state Supreme Court. Because if the federal courts rule there is no right to an abortion under federal law, the question becomes what's under state law. Now, you can challenge the ban that has been enforced since 1849, therefore it's no longer valid. Or sorry, enforced in 40 years, therefore it's no longer valid. You could also argue, which I've seen from Democrats, that successful bills after that law take precedent and negate it. For example, we now have a ban on abortion for 20 weeks in Wisconsin. Does that take precedent over the blanket ban on everything, which has been enforced because of Roe v. Wade? I do not know. But those things you'll see play out in court, which again makes the state Supreme Court race in spring of 23 Even so more. important <laughs> yes. because that court will decide those issues most likely if the U.S. Supreme Court overturns Roe. Yeah, and you kind of touched on how the Republican caucus is very split on what they want to do. It is Assembly Speaker Robin Voss that said he'd be open to adding exceptions for rape or incest, but he's got a very complex caucus also in the Senate. It's also a mixed bag. So if they do come back, maybe those discussions will come up. I mean, there's also the big issue right now of gun laws. We know Republicans don't want to touch them at all. But this, do you maybe think if lawmakers, some of them do come back on June 22nd, they can maybe caucus and talk about other matters or potentially maybe do some, some other things? Uh, I would bet you money that Dems will try and make a, I don't say a show, but a, a public stand, show up in the chamber and be there at the right time. But Republicans aren't coming in. It's going to be leadership's going to come in, one person up in the, with the gavel, one person with this microphone, in, out, done. They're going to close this thing out as quickly as they can and move on. I'm guessing nine seconds this time. I don't know. (laughs) I think the record was 11 seconds. Um, Also wanted to bring up something that's been widely talked about on the national level, not a little bit here in the state level, is more protections for judges amid a lot of security concerns. Now, of course, this comes after threats against judges have increased, and we actually saw an unfortunate incident of a retired judge last Friday, I believe, uh, was killed in his home. Um, That is still under investigation. We're still learning a lot of details about that. But when you're thinking of protections in Congress right now, since these threats have increased, what they basically want to do is take federal judges' addresses off online so it would be harder to find. We've seen with the Roe v. Wade debate, we've seen protests outside uh, many Supreme Court justices' houses. And of course, like I said, we have the Wisconsin tie right here. I spoke to some Democrats who are actually open to 
to the idea. They think that there could obviously be maybe even compromise from Republicans on their side on this issue. Um, Overall, there's been 15 pieces of legislation that has been introduced in 13 states that would shield the home addresses of judges and other court officials, according to the National Center of State Courts. Um, I did talk to Ryan Owens, who is a UW-Madison political science professor, and he also was a former AG candidate that dropped out of the race last year. And he also cited some pressures of how difficult it is now to run for office. And he, of course, supported um, some more uh, safety measures for judges. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. These are public stewards, and they deserve protection. I mean, it's it's not easy to to run for an office. It's not easy to hold a public office. You are constantly under scrutiny. And these people, you know, whether you agree with their politics or not, ought to be respected enough to have a space where they can go home, feel secure about what they're doing. And it, you look, if you dislike what they're doing, fine. You can go protest in front of the court, protest in front of the Capitol, that sort of thing. Uh, but we need to remember that these are public servants and uh, you know, we, we should treat them with, with the respect that, that they're due. So I didn't hear back from any top Republicans, whether they'd be open to this idea. I think you and I both know they're not going to come back and vote on this. Might be some legislation that we see next year. Um, the one effort going through my research that lawmakers recently did was in 2016. There was an effort to remove lawmakers' addresses, uh, phone numbers, their voting addresses in the state legislature's website, and also what we call the Wisconsin's Guidebook Blue Book. So that was one measure that was enacted after an increase in threats. But will kind of just remain to be seen if we do anything to kind of help transparency concerns. There was also a lot of news this week, JR, that I'm just going to kind of hand over to you on some new appointments and new just, some chairs. Just today. <laughs> just we had a rework today. Show. So just today, yes. we have a member of the Ethics Commission, uh, former Dane County Judge Mary, Judge Mary Ann Sumi, appointed by Greta Neubauer, the Assembly Minority Leader. She replaces somebody who had been chair but resigned because he went from being an assistant DA at Dane County to working in a private law firm. Also today, Karen Walsh, the new president of the Board of Regents, now, a little backstory here. Edmund Manny Deeds was elected chair, uh, president of the Board of Regents a year ago. Tradition has been that if you're vice president, you get to become president. But Evers appointees pushed aside Mike Grebe, elected Edmund Manny Deeds. He decided not to seek a second one year term, which has been kind of tradition, two one year term maxes, because of commencement with his law firm. Karen was vice president. She ran for president uncontested. She's now the president of the Board of Regents. Other part of the backstory is Evers now has 11 of the uh, 16 appointments on the board. Tracy Klein, the remaining Walker appointees, one of the five, resigned early, announcing yesterday she's taken off because of personal commitments with work. So he was going to appoint one more member of the board. The issue is he only has two members who have been confirmed by the state senate, Edmund and Karen, which means regardless what he does with his new uh, opening, if a Republican is elected governor, in November, he or she could walk in the door in January and rescind all those years appointees who have not been confirmed. That's the big what if, right? Big what if. Big what if. All right, I think we covered quite a lot this <laughs> week, JR. Thanks so much for joining me, and we will, get, we will see you guys next week. I'm Emily Fannin. And I'm JR Ross. Have a great weekend. This program was brought to you from the Margaret Farrell Studio. Rewind, your week in review, is sponsored by the Wisconsin Realtors Association, bringing Wisconsin communities to life with great homes, businesses, and neighborhoods. The Wisconsin Realtors Association, the voice of real estate.